The Couvent de la Tourette, built by Le Corbusier for the Dominican Order between 1953 and 1960. In the years following the end of the Second World War, there was an upsurge in religious vocations in France. Born on this wave, the Dominicans in the Provence of Lyon decided to build a new monastic school for 80 students. A retreat in which they would stay for seven years in prayer and study. The monastery was only just opened when it was faced with two converging major crises, a Catholic church that was trying to modernize with Vatican II and the students' revolt that came to a head in May 1968. In 1970, only one student remained at La Tourette. In the deserted monastery that the Dominican order was thinking of selling, some 20 friars resisted. They believed that the architecture of the place embodied the spiritual quest of their order in a unique manner. The place changed its usage and became a conference center, but it remained Dominican, saved by architecture. During the Second World War, the Dominicans bought some 80 hectares of fine land, the ancient domain of the Seigneur de la Tourette, a chateau with its farms, fields, and woods. This was the land on which the Reverend Father Couturier suggested, in 1952, that Le Corbusier should build their new monastery. When the architect undertook this work, he was 66 years old. He was at the height of his fame for his individual houses like the Villa Savoie and for his apartment buildings in Marseille and Nantes. He was busy with the building of the capital city of Chandigarh in the Punjab in India. He was the incarnation of the new architecture, whose main principles he defined in the 1930s. Take a house. Free the ground floor from the grip of the soil. Increase the garden area. Free the roof by making it into a terrace. Long live the free plan in which walls are no longer needed. The concrete slabs of the upper floors are supported on stilts. Long live the free facades that support nothing. Glass can be used with total freedom. In the spring of 1953, Le Corbusier visited the site for the first time. I drew the road. I drew the horizon. I noted the orientation of the sun. I sniffed out the topography. I decided where to build because that had not been decided at all. In choosing the site, I committed either a criminal or a worthwhile act. Here in this terrain, which is so erratic, so fugitive, flowing downhill, I said, don't sit it on the ground because of the slope. Sit it high up on the horizontal line of the building at the top. Then it will blend in with the horizon. Instead of raising the building from the ground up, the architect built it downwards from the horizontal line of the roof, letting it meet the slope that the building touched where it might, as Le Corbusier put it. This where it might is a forest of pillars, stilts, 
openwork concrete shells spread over a variation in height of 10 meters that support the building and compensate for the irregularities of the relief. The monastery is not meant to sink into the surrounding countryside. It is a concrete block on the side of a hill, concrete. This unpopular material that is kept for factories and housing estates. It is the architect's favorite material. It is also the cheapest. The building is made to be seen from far off, facing the valley with a monumental facade five stories high, flanked by the massive church that protects the monastery from the north wind. At the rear, it shows a modest facade, a small building on three levels, with a discreet entrance as behoves a place where the inhabitants live reclusive lives. The monastery is a weighty arrangement, strictly codified by tradition. A church, a chapter that serves as a town hall, a school with its classrooms and a library, accommodation for a hundred people, and there are also the public areas, corridors, a square, the cloisters, a whole town gathered within a closed quadrilateral. This is the arrangement that the architect saw and admired when, in 1907, he visited the Carthusian Monastery in Galuzzo, near Florence in Italy. In the musical landscape of Tuscany, I saw a modern city on the crown of a hill. I never thought I would see such a joyous interpretation of a habitat. Each cell had a view over the plain. The rear of each cell opened by a door and a gate onto a circular path. Each path ran through an arcade, the cloister. The communal services were regulated from there, prayer, visits, meals, burials. This modern city dates from the 15th century. Emulating the arrangement of the Galuzzo Monastery, the architect installed the friar's cells on the outer perimeter of the building, opening them onto the landscape. He constructed the loggias using molds that came directly from a community building near Nantes that he had just completed. The cells are simple volumes, five meters 92 long, 1 meter 83 wide, and 2 meters 26 high, dimensions that were the Le Corbusier patent. From the 1930s onwards, the architect had thought about the ideal architectural proportions. He defined a system founded on the golden section, whose basic unit is the human figure. He even gave a name to this ideal standard of modern architecture, le modulor. It measures 1 meter 83, the height of the average American, the hand raised to a height of 2 meters 26. Le Corbusier checked the measurements of this reference body in transatlantic liners, temples, and palaces. The proportions would be universal. A monastery is the ideal place to apply an architect's ideas about individual occupancy. Here, Frugality and discipline are wonderfully adapted to standardization and minimalism. The Le Corbusier's cell is the monastic dream come true. 10.83 practical square meters with all the comforts. Central heating, loggia, magnificent view, ideal for contemplation. But during the building work, 
One of the friars mentioned that the distressed relief of the concrete cladding was perhaps too tiring during long periods of solitary meditation. Never mind. In front of the table, Le Corbusier created a smooth concrete service that was better suited to contemplation and serenity. Today, each of the friars interprets the decoration in his own way. No two cells look alike. Conversely to the cells that are largely open to the countryside, the architect deliberately obstructed the view at the ends of the main corridors with what he called concrete flowers that look rather like medieval shields. The corridors receive daylight through long horizontal loopholes that give onto the inner courtyard. The slit theme is accentuated by the curious concrete parallelopipeds that stick out horizontally at regular intervals. Blocks that seem to pierce the walls protruding on both the inside and the outside. For want of a better word, they are usually referred to as the sugar lumps, like wedges supporting the long window openings, as if to emphasize the effort required. Their real purpose is hidden. They are just the visible part of the load-bearing structure, the discernible segment of the stilts that support the beams for the various stories. It is impossible to see the stilts and precast concrete blocks hidden under the granite on the interior and exterior walls of the building. The cells occupy the top two floors of the monastery. Below them, the corridors of the lecture rooms and the large community areas, the chapter, the library, refectory, are opened up to the view by the architect. The prime reason for his choice is functional, different facades for different purposes. The facades facing the inside courtyard are made of large squares of concrete and 2 meters 26 wide glass panels whose geometrical variations were calculated according to the modulo. They are known as Mondrian squares in reference to the work of the painter Piet Mondrian. But the architect had more in mind than just the functional legibility of the various spaces in the monastery. In the chapter and the refectory, he broke with the model of the traditional monastery and opened the large rooms to a view of valley, the contemplation of nature as a source for meditation. But the landscape is designed and redesigned by the sheets of glass and concrete mullions. The beauty of creation is only fully appreciated when measured by man. Le Corbusier charged one of his team, the young architect Zanakis, with designing the large walls. At that time, Zanakis was composing his first musical work, Metastasis. Making a combinatorial analysis of melodic intervals, he used the same mathematical rule to regulate the distances between the slim concrete posts and the glass panels. Zanakis worked on several possibilities. Le Corbusier synthesized them and called the result undulatory panels.
closed world of a monastery, the church occupies a special place. It is not reserved for the Dominicans alone, but welcomes all the faithful. The architect marked this difference in status by the forms he used. He put a wide empty space between the church and the main building and gave it a radical treatment. The walls are bare. A concrete box, a severe enclosed shape like a bunker, without any apparent openings. They can only be seen from the inside. A high vertical slit to let in the light of the rising sun. A wide horizontal slit to let in the light of the setting sun. As the church is oriented in the traditional way, it marks the sun's passage from east to west. What is lighting? It is the wall on which light falls. It is the illuminated wall. The emotion arises from what the eye sees, that is the volume, that the body receives by the impression or the pressure of the wall upon it. The church has no stained glass windows, no rose window, just the horizontal vents painted in bright colors. Two small buildings adjoin each side of the main structure. On the outside of the quadrilateral is the crypt that is ear-shaped, topped with cannon mouths to let the light in. The sacristy has seven geometric machine gun mouths for light. The sacristy on one side and the crypt on the other form the transept. Thus the church has the traditional cross shape. Where the main volume of the nave meets the transept stands the altar. On one side of the altar, in the wings of the church, is the sacristy. On the other side, the crypt, set below, as is proper, and separated from the central volume by a half screen. Sound and light flow through, but not sight. In the crypt are seven altars for the Mass that each of the monastery's priests had to celebrate individually once a day, an obligation removed by Vatican II. The crypt is no longer used. The serpentine walls that remain seem to follow the pressure of the ground and the strange slanting conduits that bring in the north light. The architecture, the only mistress present in the place, preserves its mystery. Le Corbusier fancied that Dominicans spent their time in processions. He started by envisaging a ramp on the side of the building, up which processions could climb to the roof terrace. But Dominicans do not process a great deal, and a ramp like that would have been expensive. It was never built. But the roof terrace is still there, where one can walk between earth and sky and meditate. It was the first cloister, surrounded by a wall one meter seventy high. As Le Corbusier said, it is beautiful because one cannot see the natural spectacle.
The real cloister is in the courtyard. It is a paradox. There, where you might expect to see an open passage around a square garden, there is a cross. The passages of the cloister, the architect calls them conduits, regulate the main traffic flow in the monastery, like a pump that sucks from below to make more direct paths. The main conduit ends at the door of the church, which is the only access. The other, shorter conduit connects the entrance building to the refectory and to the chapter. They cross in one of the protected public areas, the atrium, marked by its slanting roof. While the exterior aspect is of a simple cube whose facades align the variations on a single theme, the courtyard presents a sort of enigmatic and disturbing scene, the violent juxtaposition of simple volumes. The slope of the atrium, the conduits, machine gun light openings, the oratory with its chapel enclosed in a cube and its pyramidal roof, the sugar lumps. Everything here is geometric. Geometry like a child's toy. Using the cube, the pyramid, the parallelopiped, the cylinder, and the square, Le Corbusier created a cunning complexity within the infinite variety of architectural delights. When a work reaches the maximum intensity of proportion, of quality of finish, of perfection, it produces an inexpressible spatial phenomenon. The areas start to radiate physically. They radiate. They determine what I call inexpressible space. I mean a shock that does not depend on the dimensions, but on the quality of perfection. It is in the realm of the ineffable. In the same way as the spectacle of nature reveals the wealth of divine creation to the faithful, the geometric forms arranged around the courtyard reveal the wealth of human creation. Only the passage of the sun unites the two settings, the natural setting and the mental setting. Maybe that is the secret of La Tourette, its ultimate paradox. Le Corbusier did not believe in God, but he had no hesitation in stating that architecture is a religion. It is in this equation that the monastery of La Tourette frees itself from the bounds of commandment while remaining completely Dominican.